Back in the day, Ronald Reagan pointed out that it was absurd, if not obscene, that millionaires were paying a lower tax rate, and in some cases actually lower taxes, fewer taxes, than bus drivers. Here he is. We're going to close the unproductive tax loopholes that have allowed some of the truly wealthy to avoid paying their fair share. In theory, some of those loopholes were understandable, but in practice, they sometimes made it possible for millionaires to pay nothing. But a bus driver was paying 10% of his salary, and that's crazy. Do you think the millionaire ought to pay more in taxes than the bus driver, or less? More, says the audience, the Republican audience, indeed. The lead story in Austria, there is a weekly magazine, Profil, uh, which means profile. It's sort of their version of uh, Time magazine. And the cover story this week is a picture of about a dozen or so bankers, CEOs, real estate moguls, and people who inherited wealth uh, saying that they have a civic duty. I'm quoting now from a story in Business Insider by Rob Weil. They have a civic duty to give back to a country that's allowed 70% of its wealth to concentrate in the hands of the top 10%. Uh, Christian Koch, a health economist and businessman who inherited a large sum, one of the multimillionaires in Austria is calling for an increase in Austrian taxes, says, quote, a wealth tax is not only a question of morality, but also an act of pragmatism. I don't want to be a rich man in a society that can't pay to invest in a fair education system for all. A uh, variation on what that German businessman told Reuters uh, last year. I don't want to be a rich man in a poor country. Well, President Obama is suggesting that, or is supporting Elizabeth Warren's legislation that would make student loans affordable. First of all, you know, isn't it bizarre? Our government loans money to banks at, at two-tenths of one percent, but if you're a student, it's six or eight percent. I mean, this, this makes no sense. And B, she's suggesting that if we are going to underwrite education in this country, Back when I was going to college, back in the 60s and 70s, 80% of the cost of college tuition was paid for by state and federal governments. Now it's only 20%. So, so students are paying the other 80% 80, 80 now. But if we just went back to that time in terms of our educational policy, we could do it with the Buffett rule. The Buffett rule was Warren Buffett's proposal that there should be a minimum tax for very, very wealthy people so that we, he doesn't end, you don't end up in a situation like he is where his secretary is paying 36% in income taxes and he last year paid 11%. Brittany Corona is on the line with us. She's a research assistant with the Heritage Foundation and a contributor to their new online daily newspaper, The Daily Signal. You can find it over at heritage.org. Brittany, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Why are you opposed, and I don't know if it's you or institu the institutional you, but why are you opposed to the Buffett rule being used to fund our most vital infrastructure, our intellectual infrastructure, the next generation that's going to that could, you know, take this country in a really positive direction like 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 we did back in the 60s, 70s and 80s or 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 you know, if if they're not educated, I you know, it looks to me like we're starting to look like Afghanistan. Right. So I think we can all agree that education, especially higher education is in a door for uh opportunity in our American culture, and, and we want that, right? But income-based repayments and, as you pointed out, Senator Warren's bill, are going to do nothing to solve the growing student loan bubble or bring down college costs. And this isn't something that's just coming from the Heritage Foundation. This is something that's coming from the Congressional Budget Office. So there's, there's a difference in the way we look at student loan metrics. There's fair value accounting, which is not often what is pointed at when we look at reports and, and the talking points that are coming from people like Senator Warren, what they look at is the Federal Credit Reform Act numbers, which don't account for market risk. And this is a huge thing because right now we have $1 trillion in student loan debt, and $180 billion of that is because of default. This makes it very, very different from other type of uh, loan entities because you're dealing with people, especially students, who might be defaulting on their loans, and this isn't going to be sucked into the ether. This is going to fall on the backs of taxpayers, the two-thirds of America, who might not have bachelor's degrees and let alone master's degrees, are going to be funding the doctors and the lawyers that are going through getting their master's degrees and are going to out, out earn the, the people that are Well, going the majority, to number one, the majority of people in default are people who dropped out of college, which is why they went into default. And number two, we're starting from different starting points here, Brittany. I think we're operating on different assumptions. I'm asserting that education is part of the commons, 
that that's why we provide free elementary education and why we did that up until the 1920s, why we started providing free high school education. It's the reason why Thomas Jefferson was so proud that when he started the University of Virginia, it was the first free college in America, and it was free for the first many, many years of its existence long after his death. It's why Abraham Lincoln started over 50 land-grant colleges across the nation completely free. It's why the University of California system was free from the late 19th century up until the Reagan governorship. Uh, when Reagan famously said, why should I pay for, the, for these kids to go to college when all they do is protest my policies, and he pulled the plug on it. it, it, it and, and, and college was affordable for those of us who grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even the early 80s, uh, until you know, Reagan put Bill Bennett in charge of the education department, and we've seen the, the, the federal and state contribution to higher education go from, like I said, 80% of tuition down to less than 20%. Shouldn't we consider education, our intellectual infrastructure, part of the commons, and therefore a responsibility for all of us, regardless of how we fund it, rather than an opportunity for some bankster to make a profit? And I get it, you're worried about their, their uh, you know, being hurt by default or us having to pay in taxes. But, you know, if it's part of the commons, that's what taxes are for. Right. I actually think we both, we start from different presuppositions, especially on a historical paradigm, because when American founders crafted the United States Constitution, laid out the foundation for a self-government, there is nothing in the federal government that says that the feds have any kind of dictatorial power over education. There absolutely I mean, is. I actually disagree with there absolutely this is. assumption based on UVA and, and Abraham Lincoln, because the real big federal intervention in our education system came in the 70s and in the higher education. It, it what you pointed to uh, earlier in the segment, too, with Obama's recent executive order, the pay as you earn, it's also tied to Warren Bill. This is going to grow the federal debt right now, <laughs> as far as as far as student you know, loan. Assuming debt. you don't raise taxes, to... but but Brittany, let me first of all the the preamble to the Constitution, the beginning of Article One, Section Eight, and the end of Article One, Section Eight, all assert that the purpose for the Constitution was to promote the general welfare. If a well-educated populace, and to promote, you know, domestic uh, tranquility, to provide for, you know, well, I don't know that this has to do with the common defense, but uh, the, certainly the blessings of liberty, uh, number one. Number two, the largest federal intervention in higher education was not in the 70s. It was the GI Bill in the 1940s. And the GI Bill made a profit. My father was paid to go to college. My wife's father was paid to go to college. And, the, and they went to college. And, well, in the case of my wife's father, who, who graduated with his law degree and ended up the uh, assistant attorney general for the state of Michigan, more than paid in taxes what the cost of his college was. And that, I mean, we, we showed a profit on it. Why can't we learn from that? Well, the interesting thing is you're still talking about the bar or so focused on, on the bar, which is good. We, we want to see kids flourish in going to school, but there is a cost. There will always be a cost, and the cost is going to land on the taxpayers who are going to have to support. Yes, yeah, so why shouldn't work, Warren Buffett pay the same tax rate like as his secretary? Business. So, I'm sorry, but the like you pointed to, you've heard it's, pointed to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, that article on the general welfare is very loosely translated, but it's still within the structure of the government. And time it, is, it is what is used to support... ...understood that civil society best flourishes at but, home. But, Brittany, we have been using Article 1, Section 8 for the first sentence to justify the state, you know, a, a public cost, pain, the public pain for public education since the, the late 19th century. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, I, uh, Brittany, I wanted to let you get the last word. I'm sorry. I didn't, oh, no, it's, didn't, it's didn't work right. out You know, it's, it's the, the millionaire's tax focus. is It's a good talking point, but it's not looking at the debt that's going to incur upon the taxpayer. And it's okay. not going to help the students ultimately either. Okay, I leave you with the, with the final word. Brit, Brittany Corona with the Heritage Foundation, heritage.org, The Daily Signal. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you very much, Tom. This